Hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 412. That's 412, aka 412 of the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How are you doing? How are you guys feeling? Great, amazing. How am I? You know, getting on in there getting on getting on in there getting up in there getting off in there wherever i am i'm maintaining a very even steady kill as i trudge on along as the rest of you guys out there (laughs) if it's your first time check out the show via youtube of course make sure you smash like the button down below you hit subscribe you leave me a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app a five star review and a download and a share will help me spread it get it out there and let people communicate with you and all that good stuff and of course support via patreon is always more than welcome you can support the show via patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for just agostino to get one bonus agostino zinga show episode on patreon only for only my patreon subscribers for a little as one dollar or the equivalent of one pound um on patreon so make sure you sign, sign up on there don't delay get involved at patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o don't delay get on there today oh my god here we are another day another trudge um what are we what are we talking about today what have we done what have we got up to many things isn't it um i finished well finished it a couple of weeks ago watching the undoing that's a pretty decent tv series actually that's been a, a good um time but of course as i mentioned previously i've been trying to get through a few books um you know tear through some of those pages and trying to get my mind right it's been good just to kind of as well to have a bit of um to sort of unplug you know from always being on some sort of digital device whether it's my phone my laptop you you end up having square eyes or you feel like you're getting square eyes so it's always nice to sort of uh break up that routine with a little book here and there let you imagine let you think let you dwell on your actions all that good stuff get you motivated get you down inspire and all that nice stuff so that's been pretty cool i've got a couple of vladimir i've got no i've got a vladimir putin book and i've got another book about poverty so i'm trying to learn I'm trying to expand my brain. I'm trying to understand exactly what kind of um, leads to some situations that we're in as a country and as maybe as a world, um, especially in the Western, um, in the Western countries that you know deem themselves to be um, developed uh, places where they somehow allow some of the more downtrodden people to essentially go by without no help and no assistance, especially more so during COVID. And it? it's been like there's been so many easy wins out there that could they could have basically done that they've kind of failed to do so it's making me think hmm what's actually going on like what is the reason why these easy things don't get done and they always make things doubly hard for themselves what's happening here and what essentially leads people to be in a position where they need assistance need help to the extent where you know if they miss a couple of days of work a week like i imagine i think i remember never day. I, I can only imagine do you remember in the beginning of lockdown when everyone was like worried that it would go up and it would go on until the summer right remember that was a big issue oh, i was gonna go into the summer i can't be at work for that long da, 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 da. and now we're in december it's gone on near a year right january you know or february next year will be a year fully living under some level of restrictions in terms of movement and all that stuff right because we went into did we go into lockdown in february or march either way right it's been about 10 months which is wild to think in it and we've all kind of for the most part you know um god willing you know touch wood no one really close to me has passed or anything no one's got severely sick so that's been pretty cool but i think most of you know i guess i'm fortunate in that regard because most of my friends and you know people i speak to are my age or younger so it sort of helps in terms of um enabling the mortality rate to be a bit low in my friendship group but god damn it man we somehow survived didn't it we somehow managed to just hang on until the end of the year um but then again i'm not one to like test fate i'm not one to be like oh yeah we survived to the end of the year we can survive another year no nah, that's not the vibe i'm on um i think if we go another year again under this restriction you know all hell's gonna break loose so you know which i'm sure i'm sure most governments around the world are very fam- are very aware of this i'm sure if you work i'm sure if you work in a government you've probably specked out um what they call them you specked out like a worst case scenario you sort of laid it all out to bear in case like imagine you know you lay out a plan where god forbid you know the truck that's transporting all the vaccines you know um falls off the side of a cliff somewhere 
explodes and then you don't have any left and then you have to kind of wait a few months to get the new ones done you know what do you do in the interim i'm sure they've worked out all these sort of things where a terrorist attack um some other thing happens another mutation of the virus or takes flight and all of a sudden other people you know people from a kind of younger demographic are dying like it's actually quite i was wondering the other day as well i think isn't it quite fortunate that it seems to have struck the quote-unquote boomer generation as opposed to us gen z x gen z i don't know what generation i'm in like just imagine if it would have been a virus that if affects people from like the ages of 23 to 45 we'd all be dead in it and it was, it, it was an asymptomatic one right so you could be the carrier and pass it on to many people we'd all be dead legitimately all be dead like because the people i've seen who have kind of been you know living by the seat of their pants and not really giving a shit about restrictions and just doing what they want to do have generally been the young i wouldn't say younger as i mean like you know from again 21 to maybe 55 i'd say are the people who've been kind of going about life and living and doing what they want to do in it because i guess they don't you know they don't meet the threshold they think they're not going to be at risk they're fairly healthy all this sort of stuff so i can just imagine what the scenes would be just imagine all those flipping teenagers in those tiktok houses in la all the kids in my ends are just throwing house parties every weekend like it would be an absolute massacre there'd be bodies on the floor do you know what i mean let the bodies hit the floor it'll be absolute madness but anyway what can we do we are here still standing i'm happy about that glad we're gonna see out the year in a couple of weeks which is you know again if ever there was a year that you just want to go dupe and delete this will be it <laughs> um I, I i think i saw something on social that charlie broker the guy that does um black mirror is supposed to be doing some sort of a 2020 rewind wipe thing where he's sort of gonna um he's sort of going to review I guess what what happened in the year that should be pretty cool. Um, it's funny because I think this was the one year they took off from doing Black Mirror or something. I read right, um, but the year's events have sort of you know mirrored a Black Mirror episode, isn't it? So you know, there's no need to write anything because you know life uh, life imitates art, or art imitates life, whatever way around it is. So that should be fun. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, like imagine, look at the things I'm I'm sort of like holding on to. Um, new year's eve is cancelled for the most part no one's going anywhere that might just be a home thing you know get licked at home and just you know watch a couple youtube videos and fall asleep <laughs> absolute madness man it's so so bad it's so so bad so that's why i think in general because you know there's some people out there that think we rushed a vaccine that it probably isn't safe and we were trying to save face that's what i've heard someone say who the hell say that might be the side man right he said it on um uh good morning britain you know he was like oh yeah um he's kind of skeptical about taking it because he feels like the uk government is trying to sort of you know cover their bases uh because they've done such a piss poor job with the pandemic that they're trying to you know make people forget by rushing forward this uh, vaccine so that they have a bit of good news that they can hold on to like hey look what we've done we achieved the impossible we got a vaccine done in under a year and for the most part if you what you read online they say it takes about 10 years right anywhere between five to ten years i've read um to actually develop a vaccine um you know that works effectively and obviously roll it out to people so they've done it in under a year but again i just think the way it affected the, gl the globe because i think if this was a virus that affected only a certain area of the globe i don't think you know we wouldn't got a virus this quickly i think because of the collective efforts you know of various different governments around the world and again the fact that so much money is at stake i'm sure loads of like special interest bodies and you know people that hide in the shadows were throwing as much money as they can at these scientists to develop whatever vaccine they could in the space they could because most of these people who have old money they need the world to you know they need the world to sort of work and get back to work yeah get back to work in order for them to make money without the world um you know back on their little factory line whatever making iphone 4 cases that they're not going to be multi-trillionaires so they need us so that's probably why we got the vaccine early who knows man who knows either way stick it in my stick it in my eye stick it in my eyebrow uh pierce it through my eardrum i don't give a crap the sooner i get that in my body and ready to go and life returns back to normal i'll be fine um again i've uh, you know i'm willing to give up um a piece of myself for that i've already given up a, you know a lot of it anyway 
you know, you give up your data to face like Facebook. Like I deleted my original account, but then I started a new one. I'm pretty sure that data I deleted from Facebook hasn't been deleted. They still have it somewhere saved, right? Um, all of my data, all of my likes, um, all of my behaviors, all my bits of engagement, I'm sure it exists somewhere, some sort of cloud, then they're just selling it to other people behind the background. So this idea that we have privacy, um, you know, it's the whole idea behind, oh, I'm going to stick a bit of tape over my webcam camera on my laptop right but then i'm going to give this random site my middle name my surname i'm gonna log on in it every single day from the same computer i'm gonna browse amazon the same time i'm browsing that site right it's picking up all your it's learning all your behaviors so it's it's not as if like you can um say that you've got any level of privacy if you have a life on the internet or you have any sort of social media profile it's just impossible so um the last thing i'm bothered about is vaccine personally 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 but hey we're all different in it we're all different anyway we've got a jam pack show to get in on today loads of stuff to talk about so make sure you grab yourself a little drinky a little snacky and let's get in oh first things first um interesting developments in the world of boxing with uh, Jake Paul and Logan Paul, they've kind of turned themselves into the quasi celebrity um, boxing body, right? They're kind of doing their own thing. I think they might have each done it on different platforms. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, what's his name? Jake did his on Fan Mino, Fan Gogo, or something like that, mm-hmm. and Logan did his on Triller, right? Triller, Triller. Have you pronounced that name? The app that's sort of like the dancing thing is similar to TikTok. But they've sort of turned themselves into like the go-to people for these celebrity boxing matches, right? Where they sort of call out celebrities, people, you know, within their sort of like world or they go and call out, you know, actual fighters to come and fight them in the boxing. That's the sort of next evolution you're seeing now going forward. And of course, you had it confirmed with Logan Paul going to fight Floyd Mayweather in the exhibition fight which is insane just to think about it, right? You know, again, just to think about it, clearly like, you know, Logan Paul, a YouTuber who's boxed for what, the best part of two and a half years maybe, um, is going to fight one of the best boxers of his generation, maybe, you know, of all time in his weight class, a a guy that's 50 and 0 um, in the boxing ring. It's really, really odd to think about that. But again, you know, if you look a bit behind the curtain, you'd see a lot of boxing aficionados and fans would say, Although there's a lot of talent in boxing and it's probably at the highest level in terms of overall talent there is, the way it's run, the mechanisms behind it, the individual promotions, um, you know, the padding of records, the dodgy commissions, the judging, all this sort of stuff is really not helping boxing to maintain its sort of a law and appeal to the general consumer. And unfortunately, the general consumer seems to be the person that actually decides what goes and what doesn't. I think that's what the UFC has done really well. Like they have, the UFC probably has one of the best, one of the best and worst fan bases, right? They have the best fan base in terms of there's such a varying levels of experience and knowledge in the fan base, right? You've got actual people that, you know, partake in martial arts on the side and watch UFC. So they're very knowledgeable. You've got people who fight on their local circuit who watch the UFC. So they're very knowledgeable. And you've got people like myself who are like casual fans who watch the odd card here on most weekends. If they're on, I watch the odd card. I don't follow each individual fighter, but I'm very keen to kind of learn as I'm watching. And then you've got, of course, the hardcore fans who've watched UFC since the beginning. So I think it's it gives itself um a chance to compete with the basketballs and the, you know, and the American footballs in the US just because it kind of appeals to such a wide catchment of people. And I'm sure there's definitely been some, um, they've definitely been able to attract some, um, some, you know, some ex boxing fans who have sort of been a bit disillusioned with the sport and jumped onto something else. And um, I think, because I think for me personally, when, when boxing turned off for me was maybe Manny Pacquiao versus Floyd, May- Floyd Mayweather, right? That fight didn't get made for ages. And then when it finally did get made, they were both old and it wasn't what it could be. So that kind of was an illustration of just how much the infrastructure of boxing behind the scenes doesn't help the overall sport evolve and continue. Anyway, fast forward to now, these two YouTubers, um, Logan Paul and Jake Paul, of course, the Paul brothers, uh, you know, synonymous for some very viral moments on YouTube, have now turned their attention to creating these one-off special occasions, moments in history, moments in culture, I'd guess, where they essentially press pause 
uh, you know, around whatever everyone's doing around the world, and they kind of suck you into these, um, you know, uh, quasi bouts that they do with, you know, again, wash up celebrities or people that actually fight for real. And it looks like Jake Paul has decided to call out Conor McGregor. Um, now, I'm sure the Conor McGregor call out is um, pre preferably in a boxing ring, because I think if there was any opportunity that he would um, call out uh, Conor McGregor in Octagon, it would be lights out for him. I'd legitimately be afraid for his, um, you know, for his life in that regard. But if you're calling him out in a boxing ring, of course, it makes sense cause, considering what they've done previously. But it's such an insane call out, I think, just in terms of the level of skill, of course. Right. If we if you're telling me Logan Paul's a better boxer out of the two. And he doesn't look that great, you know, when you put him next to an actual boxer. And then you're telling me that somehow Jake Paul has a chance to beat Conor McGregor. I don't know what you've been smoking, mate. But this is a video where um, Jake sort of calls out Conor in a very uh, Jake Paul sort of way. And again, I don't, I don't really know what he's trying to achieve with this. But it's just a bizarre state of affairs of boxing now at the moment. What the fuck is up, you Irish cunt? Good morning, Conor McGregor. I know you're probably beating up old dudes in a bar right now, or maybe you're jacking off because you're sick of fucking your wife. I mean, Jesus before. Christ. You could do a lot better, but happy Monday. Jesus My team sent Christ. you a $50 million offer this morning. $50 million cash, proof of funds, the biggest fight offer you've ever been offered, but you're scared to fight me, Conor. You're ducking me because you don't want to lose to a fucking YouTuber. You're 0-1 as a boxer. I'm 2-0 as a boxer. I just came off the eighth biggest pay-per-view event in history, but you want to fight Dustin Prober, who has less followers on Instagram than my fucking dog. That's a fact. And Dana White, you're a fucking pussy too, you ugly fucking bald bitch. You said there's 0% chance of this fight happening, but there's 0% chance of you getting some fucking pussy. Connor, you're scared. Dana, you're scared. Sign the fucking contract, you idiots. Jesus fucking Christ. Irish bitch. So yeah, that was a call out, right? Um, if you're Connor, what do you do with that sort of information? The ego in you would obviously want to go and, you know, pull up to his house and obviously, you know, cave his head in. But it's obviously not the wise decision to, it's not just one of the wise things to do, especially considering, you know, the current um, cases over Connor's head and, you know, the, the scraps he's gone into in public and just his general um, wild boy antics outside the octagon. But in terms of a fight, like, does this really make any sense whatsoever for either party? I know 50 million is a lot of money, but again, is all money good money? Are you just always going to be dictate? Are your, all your movements going to be di dictated um, by who can provide you the bag? I don't necessarily think that's how you create like a lasting legacy. Um, you know, a legacy that sort of, um, you know, see sees the test of time and all that. Is that me making sense here, test of time? I don't think that's how you do it. I honestly don't. Um, but again, let's entertain the idea. Again, if they get into a boxing ring, I think Connor will win. If they get into an octagon, I think Connor will win. That's not really something scary or out there to say. But either these guys have balls of steel or they know something we don't. Because I think part of you, when you're, even if you're not that experienced, regardless, right, who you're fighting, you see with, you know, T.I. and Flipping Floyd when they got into a little scrap of a tiny, right? I think T.I. was jealous of floyd having a friendship or relationship with his wife in some respects and they got into some sort of passa passa and i remember people online were saying like why the hell would ti be challenging floyd Mayweather? it's like it doesn't matter when you're a man in it when someone challenges you or you feel as if you need to stand up for yourself it doesn't matter what the guy is or what they do you're gonna do it and you're gonna die on your sword so there is an element to that with these guys where they're like i'm sure there is right where even though they're calling out two of the most storied experienced fighters in the world people who are at the top top of their game um there is a part of them that generally does think that they can win because i remember i think i definitely heard logan paul say he said yeah it's a fight in it i've got a punch of chance to win right they generally think that that's, that's an opportunity so that's a scary part i think of it because again like i said i went to one group on class right to do muay thai and the appreciation i got for martial arts and the respects that i have for combat sports went up infinitely right and that was just a crappy group on class in the middle of a yoga gym somewhere right and i was like wow i don't know how to fight at all and if somebody had even just a couple of months experience more than me hell even a couple of days more experience they would kick my ass all the way back to sunday like easily 
So I can only imagine what the difference must be between somebody that's been boxing seriously for a couple of years and somebody who's dedicated their entire adulthood to fighting in a cage at the highest level. Like, it's just not even fair, in it? And I'm sure Conor as well has got a bit of boxing experience. I remember listening or reading somewhere that he had, he was like a Golden Glove champion. Again, what that means nowadays, because everyone's a Golden Gloves champion or has some sort of Golden Gloves experience, but still, he's full on a amateur level to some extent boxing as well prior to him coming into the UFC and as well he's not even like his it's not like you're fighting uh it's not like he's fighting it's I think it'd be different if he was fighting like a uh who's a good idea like a wrestler type in the UFC in boxing right because they don't necessarily have good striking like a grappler right but Connor's a striker he's known for having good hands he's known for kicking people really well in the head so to suggest that that is a good idea for somebody, again, that's got less... Because, you know, we saw the gap between Connor and Floyd Mayweather, right? The first four rounds, I think, were decent, right? Connor landed that uppercut everyone keeps talking about. Floyd would tell you he didn't want to... He was purposely being easy on Connor because he wanted to make a next spectacle. But I get the feeling that it was a close fight in the beginning. I think he earned his respect in the first four rounds. And then, you know, Connor gassed as he always does in the UFC. And then Floyd Mayweather being the pro that he is, took advantage of it and just sort of, like, turned you know, um, put his foot down on the accelerator and just completely steamrolled Connor for the most part and finished the fight, I think in the fifth or sixth or something, right? So we know that can happen to someone like a Connor at his level. Now, Connor's got what? Since that fight, has it been three years, maybe more? So And supposedly everyone in his camp, again, it's hard to listen to coaches because they're always going to ride for their guy, but everyone in his camp is saying that he's much better than he was prior. So he's got, so he was, he was decent enough to give Floyd a good fight for four rounds. Now he's got three, and he still lost, right? convincingly now he's got three years experience and he's put on a bit of size and you want to fight him i don't know man these guys are mad in it but again I, I respect the i respect the flipping um balls of steel they have and then i guess the next video we have here is of um jake paul deciding to throw some water balloons at dylan dennis as he's doing quite funnily enough the um food truck diaries to me it looks like a bit of a st it looks like they set it up it looks like one of those kind of youtube pranks right um especially when you consider that brendan shaw is friends with logan paul then it makes complete sense that they kind of want to do this but Either way, they're really cranking up the pressure this their, his team. They're really trying to push this fight forward and make this a thing. The Dylan Dennis thing may make a bit more sense for Jake because I guess he's a traditional, what, he's a jiu-jitsu guy, right? He's not known for his striking, so that might make more of sense in terms of getting him in the ring. But still, somebody that's been fighting professionally at that level, I still, I, I'm still going to put them my mind in a professional. I don't know why it is, but maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not. Let's watch the video of Jake Paul throwing the war balloons at Dylan Dennis. Conor McGregor's friend Dylan pickup truck. Dennis. Dennis, you gotta check in when you come to LA. And he had this video attached to it. Hey, look! It's Conor McGregor's right there! <laughs> Like it stops right as they're a bit talking, he shouts like slur and he throws water balloons at him. It's quite funny. I'm gonna go ahead and replay this. So again, I don't know, man. What do you think? Do you give uh, Jake Paul any chance? Uh of defeating Conor McGregor? Do you think he's got a chance of even defeating Dylan Dennis? I would love to know in the comments down below. I don't necessarily give him any ch chance, but hey, you never know. Stranger things have happened. The internet is going crazy because um, Tom Cruise decided to get um, to act like a boss and put his foot down and um, tell off his, uh, you know, tell off people on his set for not following the COVID rules. And um, the response has been interesting. I think a lot of people have been, you know, putting some, shining some light on his uh, religious affiliations, of course, with his Church of Scientology. Some have also been pointing out some of his more, I think there's someone pointing out, what interview was it? Somebody mentioned that he's kind of difficult to work with in general, right? He's, he's quite hard, he's demanding. They try to put that out there. But in general, I don't think it's that big of a story or something to get that worked up about. I think it makes complete sense that an actor of his level a producer, a director, whatever it is, executive would be 
on edge the way he is, especially when you read all the accounts online, um, reports from, you know, that I've been reading online in California. I think about the, um, Hollywood or the entertainment industry be given an exempt status. And a lot of people, of course, naturally, small business owners are super pissed off, right? There was that viral video of that lady in LA somewhere where she was not allowed to open her restaurant, even though she made it COVID compliant and she set up outdoor seating. They shut it all down because I think you're not allowed to do any dining at all in LA. But then they gave special dispensation to a film set that was filming in her parking lot next to her business so she's having to go into work every day to do whatever she needs to do and having to look across the parking lot and see a full um catering sort of film setup set up set up in the parking lot that must be a hard pill to swallow in it so for sure a lot of the hollywood people who are not the most self-aware out there in the world are very aware especially now post the imagine song and all this sort of bullshit they've been doing where it hasn't necessarily gone the reaction they would um have hoped they're very aware of how much bad pr they got out there the last thing they want is for a case is for some story to come out about you know covid running rampant in a certain area uh or a certain studio because people didn't you know abide by the rules so i definitely understand the outrage especially from tom cruise's end so this is an article here from bbc it says tom cruise recording emerges star shouting at film crew over covid um it says here a recording has emerged of tom cruise apparently shouting at workers on the set of mission impossible 7 great franchise um threatening to fire them if they broke the covid nine uh, covid 19 sorry um, guidelines the sun published the expletive laden audio in which Cruz said i'm gonna play the audio for you because i think that's more entertaining let's actually hear what he has to say i think rex chapman uploaded it so it's here boom 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 here we go it's got 6.7 million views yes, it's because they believe in us and what we're doing. I'm on the phone with every studio at night. Insurance companies. Producers. And they're looking at us and using us to make their movies. We are creating thousands of jobs, you I don't ever want to see it again. Ever. And if you don't do it, you're fired. And I see you do it again, you're gone and anyone on this crew does it that's it and you too and you too and you don't you ever f do it again that's, that's it and it's fairly clear right um, again some of it sounds a bit staged and it's only an audio clip but it does come across a little bit like you know um he's in a full actor mode there but maybe that's just what he sounds like and we don't actually hear what he sounds like outside of movies but i think it's a perfectly reasonable response man um again considering the amount of scrutiny um celebrities have been put under during covid um you know the fact that they they're not the most self-aware people in the world the fact that they're a bit detached um the fact that they have no um understanding of what the average person going through but then they're trying to emote online it's been very difficult to deal with as i guess a population to be a subject Objected to you know the narcissistic tendencies and wants of people who genuinely need to have that itch scratch but they can't get it scratched now just has to sit around at home and the last thing you want to do is at your job you know make a further but you know ruin a reputation for yourself and put yourself in a position where you, your food movie might get you know might not even get seen because that's the other thing too there's no guarantee mission impossible 7 even comes out in the cinema what cinemas are still open, right? I think, didn't I read somewhere about certain cinemas closing down for good? Um, of course, Warner's, Warner decided to um, the, offer up all of the releases coming out next year on the streaming platform they have at the same time as theatres. So whenever theatres are open, they're open, but they also offer up on their streaming platform. So there's definitely been a bit of a change in terms of how the Hollywood entertainment industry is approaching cinema. So it's, he's definitely within his rights to react that way because again, there's no guarantee when they finish a movie that it's going to be available to watch in cinema. So that takes away a huge chunk of revenue um, earning potential that they would have with it. So again, the last thing you want on top of that is for people to get COVID on your set so again i have absolutely no issues with it whatsoever um but again i think if you're not really a fan of tom cruise it's an easy stick to beat him over the head with in it we have 
hear some interesting and funny news regarding COVID and Christmas rules here in the UK. Boris Johnson uh, clarified the uh, calls for shorter, smaller celebrations. This comes off the back of, um, you know, the last few or no, the last few weeks case numbers have been rising. So we went back to this tiered. No, so case numbers are rising just after the national lockdown. Then we entered the tiered lockdown where certain locations around the UK were placed in tiers one to three. Obviously, one being the lowest, uh, three being the highest in terms of strictest restrictions. And they reviewed them on like a two week basis or something like that. I think something like two week basis, regardless. Um, and of course, London was put in the you know, COVID um, tier two level. And now because of cases have been rising, we've been put into a tier three. But prior to this tier system, there was also talk of a potential grace period, a potential realization of the rules for COVID during Christmas. So the idea was to have five days where you would allow people to kind of um, go to different households because at the moment you have to stick to your own and the support bubble. But with the COVID realization rules, I think it allows up to three households to mix indoors um, in order to kind of, you know, enjoy, enjoy their Christmas or festive celebrations. And it didn't make no sense then and it doesn't make no sense now. If the numbers are going up in terms of cases and you need to lock us down and you need to, you know, put us in different tiers in order to kind of uh, level out the cases and, you know, make sure we don't put a strain on the NHS and hospitals, blah, 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 blah. Then why would you allow people to go into different homes during Christmas? Especially, you know, knowing full well that most people are going to go above the whatever um grace and a put uh, you know permission you've given them they're going to just take it to the hill especially during a festive period and people just want to let their hair down and hang out with their family and friends and have a drink have a bit of a dance doesn't make any sense and again logically too like what who's given these people ideas that somehow um covid takes a break during christmas that somehow you know a magical opportunity you know a magical time you know between the 21st and whatever else or onwards somehow you know covid relaxes and takes us off the pedal goes to sleep and allows us to eat our mince pies in peace doesn't make any sense does it but hey let's carry on with the article so this is from bbc news it says boris johnson has urged people to keep christmas celebrations short and small to reduce the risk of spreading covid short and small just request that 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 doesn't work in it um, it says the restrictions will stay will still be relaxed between the 23rd or 27th of December, but the PM said that people should think hard before meeting friends and family. You should think hard. That's what that's the most you should do. Of course, no one's calling. Look, don't get me wrong. I'm not calling for a China level, um, you know, surveillance. I'm not calling for you know police officers and the army on the street like they did in Spain, right? That's what I'm because we're not going to respond well to it, but enforcing rules by you know encouraging people to do the right thing and to think long and hard is the equivalent to like you know that kid in school who's like bratty and doesn't really listen to the teachers and then when it comes to you know parents evening you see them acting the same in front of their parents and they're like hey johnny stop doing that johnny stop and he talks to them like an adult because they think that's the way to parent that's where you can kind of parent a five-year-old um this is equivalent to what we're doing with our population we we're, we're kind of you know inherently aware that we've sort of like we're not going to listen anyway so we're trying to you know come we're trying to convince the st the nation in a very uh what you call it hands-offy wishy-washy kind of way and i don't think it's going to work but hey let's continue he says three households will be allowed to meet apart from in wales where law change will allow just two households and in scotland people are being asked to only meet um on one of the five days so again varying levels of permission somehow even though we have the highest levels of covid cases i think in europe um we're somehow the ones that are willing to do all these sort of weird tiered and relaxed period things it's just odd it's very very odd um it comes um as the uk recorded a further 12 to 25,161 coronavirus cases on Wednesday, along with 612 deaths within a 28 days of positive test. God almighty. Mr. Johnson said the laws was remaining um, the same in England, but smaller Christmas is going to be a safer Christmas and a shorter Christmas is a safer Christmas. <laughs> I love these little, um, you know, these little anecdotes they kind of throw out there, these sort of weird jingles that they sort of think is going to work and kind of get us to all behave and it's all sort of going to tell off the virus. It's like, do you remember before they tried to like make the virus, um, they tried to make the virus into a thing, a person, right? Uh, we're going to defeat it. We're going to beat this thing. It's like, what? And now they're trying to sing songs to it. These little jingles like... Speaking of Downing Street press conference, 
He said the rules allowing free household to meet over five days were maximums, not targets to aim for. It's always best um, going to be the safest to minimise the number of people you meet. So again, suggestions. After a news conference, the UK and Scottish and Welsh governments issued a joint statement saying that they cannot be a normal Christmas and that they strongly recommend people stay at home. They advise people who are visiting others to stop not necessarily social contact as soon as possible for at least five days before travelling. No one should visit um, another household. Mr Johnson also advised people to do you know, avoid travelling from high uh, prevalence areas to those on lower rates of coronavirus and not to stay away from home overnight if possible. I've said it already before in the beginning of this show, or no, beginning of the podcast, or maybe beginning of the pandemic. It might have been a few months ago. I was saying already, like again, I'm not the I'm not the best person to get advice from this because I don't give a shit about my birthday, Christmas. You know, I don't, none of these things matter to me. But I, in an ideal world, I think the most sensible solution would have been to say, hey, especially in light of the vaccine, the vaccine is definitely the game changer. When we announced we had a vaccine, there should have been a read. There should have been um. Uh, back to the draw boards um you know approach to what we do from you know christmas onwards and i think what would have made sense with the vaccine in the back of your mind would have been hey we're the government we're going to be honest with the population we're going to say hey the numbers are creeping up right but we have this vaccine that could solve everything but we're going to need you guys to sort of band together a bit of um you know uh british pride stiff up a lip whatever you want to do Right, we need to band together, work together in order to kind of crush this virus, you know, again, do the whole crushing phrasing thing. And what we're asking you is for a temporary sacrifice for um, a shorter journey back to normality next year. So they tell us, hey, we're, going, we're thinking of not allowing you to mix into different households in Christmas, and we're advising strongly that you should spend Christmas at home. Now, obviously, the people that want to go out with their families and see other people will go anyway because you can't enforce it. You can't exactly have roaming people of police around every street corner in the UK stopping people from leaving their homes. But just putting it out there is going to put some people off, right? But the people that do want to go will go regardless. But what you end up doing is that you say, hey, we're going to take, we're going to make sure we try and lock this down between the beginning of December to the middle of, Gen of January so that we can get back to normal quicker in the new year with the vaccine in mind that would have been a far better idea to do far better thing to do because what we have now is we have this tiered system that gets reviewed every two weeks then we have this five-day grace period then we have you know it's like it's an opening and a closing of different places and it's also encouraging people to just kind of look for ways around the rules because that's what i've heard the most online especially on social most people are talking about how they can get around the restrictions how they can get around this how they can get around that it's not really about you know adherence it's about okay that's what you said but here's what i'm gonna do so if that was the case why not just be honest from the beginning and just say look we fucked up we didn't do this earlier in the summer but now time is gone we can't go back in time we're gonna you know do what we can do now at the moment to save our country and save our economy and we've got a vaccine right but we can't rely on it yet because we can't you know dose everyone at the same time it's impossible so for the meantime stay indoors don't go out all this sort of stuff limit your you know travel only essential shopping blah 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 all the common stuff and sacrifice your christmas for this year so that next year we can get back to normal no big deal and then of course at the back of the head or as a little extra incentive plan something for the you know for when we come out of the lockdown plan i don't know a special bank holiday uh another e uh, help out scheme whatever something along those lines would have made far better sense than just allowing everyone to kind of go out and do what they want for five days and then close it again it's like god almighty man what is going on but again what can you do then we've got news here from germany which is maybe another indication that Berghain is very, very far away in my future, if not the furthest away from my future. <laughs> it says COVID-19, Germany introduces new restrictions amid rising cases. So they've gone the other way, right? You know, UK have gone all wishy-washy. They've gone completely the other end. They're like, no, 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 no. We have to put this under wraps once and for all. So it says the following. Germany has entered a hard lockdown, closing schools, non-essential businesses, and an attempt to stop the sharp spread of COVID. So I guess in the UK, we've done the opposite. We've, um, the government have basically said, schools are the last thing to close under no circumstances can school close i think a school in greenwich or somewhere tried to close and the government threatened to sue blah 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 so they're just saying look we're not we're not willing to sacrifice the education of our children in order to stop the spread of covid it is what it is kids don't pass it on even if they do you know 
different approaches. So the article says the following. The measures will be in place until the 10th of January. Christmas will see a slight easing with one household allowed to host up to four close family members. The country reported another 952 deaths and um, 27 thousand and seven hundred and twenty eight cases on Wednesday. Now is that more deaths than us or is that less? Let me quickly check that that number that I saw here. Bu, 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 bu. Yeah it's about the same in it. We're about in this we're about in the same ballpark really in terms of numbers. We have twenty five thousand and six hundred and twelve deaths and they have twenty seven. Again it's just frightening that we're sort of using this sort of you know mundane language to describe this horrible event. But hey what can we do? We continue on. Um, let's go back here. So, meanwhile, EU um, Chief Ursula von der Leyen said the first COVID vaccine will be authorized for use within a week. Miss von der Leyen, um, Leyen or Leyen said the European Parliament and the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine developed in Germany will be rolled out um, for the block the same day, uh, more than a week earlier than the original envisaged. Um, the news came after the German government said it was pressuring the European Medics Agency, the EMA, to speed up approval of the vaccine. Is that speed up word again? It has already been approved by the regulators in the UK and the US. The EMA is due to discuss the rollout next Monday. Other European countries have joined Germany in tightening its restrictions. Ahead of Christmas, France has entered a nighttime curfew. So what are the new measures? Only essential businesses such as supermarkets and banks will be allowed to reopen. To remain open, sorry, restaurants and bars and leisure centres have been shut since November and some areas in the country have imposed um their own lockdown so again Burkhine is out of my future it's a long way away maybe if we take into account what everyone's saying or exactly what the people that i've been covering on on this podcast have been saying about um, live events maybe returning in the summer of 2022 that is probably more likely or what is most likely going to happen is that we're going to have a repeat of what we saw this year summer right where a lot of the outdoor um sort of like um, open air venues in berlin or in, in parts of germany will be obviously allowed to open with some level of restrictions i think that will definitely be a, a case but in terms of being in an absolute in an actual nightclub on a hard floor um dingy no light smoke machine everywhere that's a long, long way, way, way away, unfortunately. It continues. Hair salons are among the businesses which must close while drinking alcohol in public places, which is a big thing over there, right? Everyone drinks alcohol in public, such as popular mold wine stores is forbidden. Companies are being urged to allow companies to employees to work from home. I did see a video earlier about some shops in Berlin or something, you know, selling mold wine from their stores and have letting people take them take away and stuff because that's a bit a big tradition during the Christmas markets. Um, the manager in 52 fatalities announced on Wednesdays are a new peak in Germany's pandemic, but may cover numbers that were not included in the previous day. Okay, cool. It's nearly a thousand. That's insane, isn't it? Um, Lothar Weiler, um, head of the Germany's Robert Kusch Institution, um, which is overseeing the COVID-19 response, said the situation was more serious than ever been. The number of cases is higher than it's ever, and they keep rising. There is a danger that the situation will keep getting worse and it will get harder and harder to deal with the pandemic and its consequences. Um, Deutsche Wheeler, or Deutsche Wheeler, Wheeler, have you pronounced that word, reported that while the cases in the younger population were falling, they were still rising among older people who are more likely to suffer from serious problems with the virus. Numbers in intensive care are said to have reached alarming hair levels. Wow, it's going off in Germany, isn't it? Announcing the new measures over the weekend, Chancellor Angela Merkel said that the lockdown light began in November had not done enough to bring the virus under control the figures are um, particularly shocking as during the early months of the pandemic germany was one of the successful areas in european countries and the pandemic yeah it was and i and i was still i still regret not going i was meant to go i think about when it might have been august but i ended up um, backing out of it but there was a period in time where you know germany were doing pretty well france was doing pretty well all the places that all the playgrounds were happening right um the possession party um the else thing open there that wasn't a playground but you get what i mean right they were doing pretty well people were booked in there you know the parties look pretty amazing and i should have went just for the sake of it but there is a part of me that also wants to wait until clubs are actually back to go back to a nightclub i don't actually want to go to these in between things i don't want to be sat at a table um you know um ordering drinks like i'm in some soho club i don't want to be outdoors when i don't want to be outdoors i want to be inside somewhere dark dingy um full of smoke and surrounded by people wearing you know straps all over themselves and whatever it may be that's where i want to be and again unfortunately for us um fans of the old berlin this is going to be a long way way in the future so st stand strong stand strong stand strong 
that's that like Trump quote. But yeah, um, remain strong, my uh, German folk and friends out there. Um, you know, hopefully better days are coming in the future. Moving on, moving on. Oh, this is a hot one. This is a hot one. Hot, 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 hotty, hotty one. So, as most of you are, I think, do you, are most of you aware? 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 Maybe not. But there was a bit of conversation earlier in the year, right? When the whole Bon Appetit thing was going down, and you know there was a lot of there was a lot of um, accusations of discrimination, um, unfair pay, bad working conditions, all the nice stuff that you associate with the wonderful place that is known as Condé Nast, right? And there was a bit of pressure that was being put on, you know, the main honcho over there, Anna Winter where they were essentially suggesting that her time had come, she's part of the old guard, she doesn't understand what the new generation wants and needed some fresh new blood um, in Condé Nast to sort of steer the ship in a new into the new frontier. And the pressure was sort of mounting, right? There were people coming out with stories about some of the um, bad working conditions they were worked in uh, under during an internship and just loads of very questionable and interest no questionable and maybe pressurizing sort of stories that you know for anybody else would feel the heat and immediately try and get out of the kitchen to avoid any um possible scandal or any reputation damage but of course if you're Anna Winter and you've got you know decades and decades of experience in the industry you've seen your fair share of scandals you've seen your fair share of employee uproar and she's put herself in a position or Condé Nassar put her, her in a position where she essentially has carte blanche should do exactly what she wants and if anything the conversations that she had in the beginning you know trying to reconcile between some of the Bon Appetit staff and some other people in fashion were basically her way of kind of being charitable she probably didn't need to have the sit down she probably didn't need to you know emphasize that she was going to do you know racial diversity training bullshit or anti-racist whatever she was talking about right that was just probably her way of being courteous i think if she wanted to she could have easily ignored it and moved on and just continued going on like nothing happened because if the reason why i say that is because of this news that came out completely nowhere right um new york times Condé Nast puts anna winter in charge of magazines worldwide people are now referring to her as like Cersei Lannister mate she's just the boss of everything so from one minute from getting threatened and you know being called out and being told to step down from your job to then suddenly turning around you know middle finger behind your back and saying mm, I'm gonna be the boss of everything now I'll give myself a promotion that is some boss shit says here the veteran um, editor gets more power and two new job titles chief content officer and global editorial director of Vogue uh this is from M. Edmund Lee it says Going into this week, Anna Winter was already one of the um, most popular people in the magazine world. She had been editor in chief of the United States edition of Vogue since 1988. Insane that she's hung on this long. I wonder what it is about people in these sort of positions. You see a lot with Anna DeGeneres, right? They just don't want to let go of that power. I wonder what it is. It must be intoxicating, isn't it? But imagine being at the top or being at the pinnacle um, of your industry, right? Being the go to person, being the connector, uh, you know at that level and you're still holding on now especially with all the you know uh in especially with all the sort of like social movements happening at the moment right the conversations happening are, are you know even for myself i'm a fairly young guy but they're pretty tiring to kind of keep abreast of what's going on pay attention make sure you're doing your part and imagine somebody older doing that sort of thing right it's just it must be exhausting like keeping up with all that stuff but you know i guess if you're I guess it's part of your makeup and you just I don't know I don't know it's mad 1988 is just insane I thought it was like later than that I don't know why I didn't know 90. anyway continue this is the director of Vogue's parent company Condé Nast since 2013 and the company's global content advisor since 2019 so she's been giving herself a, a, a raise or a bump you know quite recently since 2013 anyway continues on Tuesday as part of the larger revamping Condé Nast announced that Miss Winter will have a pair of new titles worldwide chief content officer and global editorial director of Vogue giving her the final say of her publications in more than 30 markets around the world I'm sure the editors-in-chief of Vogue Turkey and Germany and shit are going to be over the moon about this I'm sure they are <laughs> in addition um, to the evaluation uh, ev ev 
elevation, sorry, elevation of its editorial leader, Condé Nast announced that Amy Astley, um, a confidant of Miss Winter, will be the global editorial director of AD. Um, the title formerly known as Architectural Digest, Will Welch will become the global editor of GQ. Oh, that's awesome. I know Will, or I know of him online. Um, Diva Tani will be given the role um, of Condé Nast Traveller. Edward Enifo, of course, um, Vogue UK legend, the most powerful black editor at Condé Nast, was made the head of Vogue's editions in Britain, France, Italy, Germany, and Spain. I wonder what happens to Emmanuel Ultimate. Um, Simone Marchetti will be given the European editorial director of Vanity Fair, putting him in charge of the editions in France, Italy, and Spain. The American British versions of Vanity Fair will remain under the tutelage of Radhika Jones. Of the six weekly so of the six newly created top leadership roles within the editorial division, two went to people of colour. Condon has said that the worldwide editorial directors will be named for its un other publications earlier this year. See, they even have to do, like, imagine having to prescribe job opportunities to people of colour in fashion just because you have so many, like... There is a good thing in it, right? It's obviously, it comes from a good place, but it does show you the amount of whitewashing in fashion, right? They present you one face in the magazines. You see all these amazing diverse casts of models and, you know, brand owners and stuff, but people actually working behind the scenes. It's just, you know, full on beige. I said before, like when I went to Central London one day and I ended up, uh, you know, randomly, I was, I was outside Vogue House, right? The office of Vogue magazine, of course, in Central. I think it's one of them. I don't know if it's the main one. But it happened to be the same time I was standing out there on my bike, like trying to fix a punch or something. I don't know why I was there. I was just on my bike, just ch chilling, probably watching some of the girls come out or they're coming out for lunch. It happened to be the same time that the fire alarm went off and they all just came out, right? The whole building started piling out into the streets. And the one thing I realized, right, I was like, oh, cool, fair enough. There's a lot of pretty girls that work at Vogue. Cool. That, that's, you know, that's part of the course. But I was like, Jesus Christ, a lot of white girls, isn't it? Just white upon, like you see the old Asian lady here and there, um, but that was it. Just white, 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 and that, and that made me think, oh, okay, so all these sort of, you know, um, affirmative action sort of things that they're doing in terms of putting certain people of color in positions, as cringe as they are, um, as maybe counterproductive as they can be, they're actually essential because they generally don't have different voices um represented within those builders or the bit or sometimes the voices they're trying to communicate to aren't in those rooms so when you see some really foolish decisions to put some stupid you know t-shirt on somebody on the fashion shoot it's usually because they don't have anyone else that's objecting in the room it's just people that look exactly like them so again it's cringy but again it, 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 it it's just another indication of just how much you know, how intoxicating the power to Anna Winter that she'd want to be around during this whole reshuffle because for sure something else will go wrong, you know, doing this restructure. It'll be, you know, everyone's happy with it because they've got a new gig. But over time, once the sort of, you know, once the dust settles, people have something else to complain about and she's still going to be there hanging on for dear life. It continues, it says, until now the international editions of many Condé Nast titles were run largely by the top editors in the countries. Of course, that's why Emmanuel Alt comes in, who's a very powerful a uh, person within uh, Vogue Paris. Um, it says here, yeah, so largely run by the top editors in the countries where they are based. With the shakeout, the leadership team in New York will have more oversized part of what the company trans uh, described in the news release as the global unification of the brand editorial teams. Now, I wonder what this is about because obviously a lot of people have been complaining about Vogue Paris, right? Um, is it Vogue Paris or Vogue France? Vogue France, right? Um, Vogue FR, sorry, that's um, under the tutelage of Emmanuel Alt that was formerly under the tutelage of uh, Karin Reutfeld and I guess and Emmanuel Alt and Karen Warfeld fell out somehow. It was an epic beef. I remember back in the day when I used to be on like Fashion Spot Forum, you'd always you know read about this sort of like tit 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 tay they had, and somehow within the shakeup she managed to hold on to some of the better stylists at um, Vogue France. Um, you know, and a uh, thing which Karen Warfeld took a couple of her to see our magazine, but all in all it sort of felt you know it made sense. But then over time, Emmanuel Alt's vision and styling hasn't really evolved. This sort of the same old you know sailory kitschy french girl sort of vibe that she kind of continually does it's always kind of really sparkly dresses to go out at night or stripes and boat shoes to go out in a day it's not really anything different from that but there's still some great t t styling tips in there because i still think she's a you know up there with one of the best stylists in the world still even though it, her sort of vision taste is sort of bit dated but there is a lot of 
pushback from the fans from what I see where they basically say she's just boring in it she's just killing her magazine and people are working there with her too there's another lady too that's a sort of like right hand woman I forgot her name um they have sort of a similar sort of vision so I wonder if this was a shake-up in place where they're waiting to be like hey that's one of our biggest markets we can't lose that we can't lose that magazine we can't lose that fan base or the customer base we'd rather kind of bring it all in-house under the new york leadership so we can kind of guide them in the right way and there's also another thing i read online where supposedly with vogue spain um some of the people you know up you know in the upper echelons of um condo nas were unhappy that they would you know feature zara bits and pieces there um i guess you know of course you know zara is obviously based there um what's his name uh, ortega the main dude uh for the company that owns uh zara is obviously very influential very powerful figure but i heard that that was an issue as well so that might be part of the problem that might be part of the reason why they did this big shake-up or it could just be because you know they're feeling the heat and they kind of want to be seen to do something performative who knows but regardless interesting um last bits here says the further promotion of miss winter 71 comes after she was criticized by members of her own staff for fostering a workplace that sideline women of color the move also comes as a res um, respite to years of whispers and gossip columns at the industry standard parties that she would be leaving vogue which she's never gonna do she's gonna die on that table no offense god willing she doesn't die anytime soon but she's definitely going to um have to be you know pulled out of there um against her will says here robert roger lynch sorry the condon nurse chief executive made his support clear in a statement on tuesday saying anna's appointment represents a pivotal moment uh, for condon nurse as an ability to stay ahead of in connecting with a new audience while cultivating and mentoring some of the today's brightest talents in the industry has made her one of the world's also, one of media's most distinguished executives. The New Yorker is one of Condé Nast's publications that is not part of Miss Winter's purview. Uh, David Rimnick, da, 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 we don't care about New Yorker. Uh, da, 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 da. So, yeah. Who's this? Oh, so who stepped down? Shortly after the corporate reconstruction. Oh, the promotion of Miss Winter. Three powerful editors of Vogue's international, international left the company. See, already. Um, Angelica Chung, um, the head of Vogue China, for nearly two decades stepped down last Tuesday. Vogue China has been one of Condé Nast's top performing titles, one of the rare US media brands that has gained a large following in China. Soon after Miss Chung's exit, um, Christina Arp, the head of Vogue Germany, announced her departure. Also this month, the head of Vogue Spain, Eugenia de la Torre de la Torriente um, said that she'll be leaving the company so pff, three big people there right Vogue China Vogue Germany and Vogue Spain editors all stepped down and said that the changes come as a company grapples with declining sales and staff unrest over issues of diversity and inclusion the company has also had to, to contend with the shaking the shrinking base of print readers which has led to layoffs and pay cuts <sighs> Yeah, but you know, Anna Winter, sorry, Anna Winter didn't get a pay cut, did she? I bet she did not. But again, interesting to see how that goes on. Um, I'm sure there are some who have been, you know, who've got, uh, who've benefited greatly from this shakeup, others who haven't benefited at all, and some who could be, be continued to be looked over, overlooked in some respects because, you know, fashion is a hell of an industry to make it in. But again, interesting um, shakeup. I'll be interested to see how this develops over time okay next on this what else do we have here oh yeah this is an interesting story this is from page six i just saw this this morning actually i was like what the effing hell is going on here so this is from page six and it says um i've got to get here on the screen Page six, um, Alison Roman won't return to New York Times after Chrissy Teigen drama. And it got me thinking, is Chrissy Teigen the most powerful person in Hollywood? Or maybe in entertainment? Like she got at DJ Academics fired, right? If you believe what you read online and read between the lines. DJ Academics went on a bit of a Henny Field rant and somehow got into um, insulting John Legend and then somehow it got into then insult on his wife Chrissy Teigen um which was very left field and out of nowhere but according to him she'd been saying stuff here and there about him um you know sending some uh, indirects as they say I'm not tagging him in a tweet and he obviously uh, felt a bit annoyed by that and decided to call her some mad names live on Twitch. Twitch then had to suspend his account for a, um, a couple of weeks. He was suspended from Everyday Struggle and then eventually, guess what? Everyday Struggle is not in the air anymore. Even Everyday Struggle is probably one of the 
I'd guess the most successful maybe after Hot Ones or something like that, which they don't even produce themselves. It's something that Sean Evans just brought to Complex. But in terms of, uh, you know, in-house thing, Everyday Struggle, even after Joe Budden's departure, was very, very popular. So for them to pull Everyday Struggle and say, hey, we're not doing it anymore, either they just couldn't come to, you know, some sort of conclusion or negotiation that makes sense for everybody in terms of the new contracts, or there was so much pressure behind the scenes, you know, with people like Ak involved that they had to kind of cut the show off, especially if they wanted to get rid of Ak, they couldn't have continued it on because, you know, I'm sure you could survive you know, Everyday Struggle could probably survive with Joe leaving and keeping Ak, but you can't survive with having, you know, none of the, you have to have one of the original two on there. But yeah, this got me thinking, I was like, bloody hell. And Alison Roman, you know, if you guys are aware, she got involved in a little bit of a passa passa with Chrissy Teigen early in the year about some cookware bullshit. And then suddenly she got cancelled online. She wrote an apology, grovelling at Chrissy Teigen's feet. Chrissy Teigen then wrote a letter, a note thing, talking about how much she loved uh, Alison Roman. She was disappointed. They ended up reconciling. But since then, you know, Alison Roman's um, life has never been the same, really, isn't it? <laughs> it's really bizarre, man. These people are so powerful. It's absolutely insane. So it's actually, in it's actually funny whenever they talk about the patriarchy because, you know, who's got more power that there's not many men that exist, especially in the entertainment industry, that would have as much cancelling power as Chris Teigen. I don't think so. But anyway, consider the article. Alison Roman announced that she will not return to the New York Times after taking a break from the gig following her controversial comments on Chrissy Teigen. She said, it feels like a good time to formally announce or mention I won't be returning to New York Tea Cooking, the former com columnist of 85 on Instagram on Wednesday. I'm proud of the work we've made together, but excited for this new chapter, which includes more recipes, videos and writing over a newsletter and beyond. A spokesman sub guess she's going to start a sub stack. Whenever people leave corporate jobs in America, the first thing they do is start a sub stack. So definitely watch out for a sub stack coming very soon and make sure you, uh, I don't know, buy a subscription, whatever it may be. And um, we continue. A spokesperson for the New York Times told Page Six on Wednesday, Alison decided to move on from the Times and we're very thankful for her work with us. Roman's column was temporarily shelved back in May after the writer bashed Chrissy Teigen's uh, trajectory in the food world in an interview with the new consumer, which I didn't think was a big deal at the time. I definitely thought I, I think you're allowed to hate especially if you're somebody of you know of notoriety I think it's quite refreshing when they come out and say hey I'm quite jealous of that person I just didn't like that they made it into like a white woman versus a POC woman thing that was just bullshit it's just two women being catty who work in the same industry kind of you know throwing darts at each other or one of them throwing darts at each other it is what it is but anyway this is a quote what Chrissy Teigen has done is crazy to me Alice Rubber said at the time she had a successful cookbook and then it was like boom line at target boom now she was an Instagram page that has over a million followers where it's just like people are running content farm for her that horrifies me and it's not something that I ever want to do and I don't aspire to do that now of course at the time when you read that it definitely sounded like somebody that was jealous it definitely sounded like somebody who wanted those same opportunities or it definitely sounded like at the very least somebody who was questioning how somebody that they deemed to be less talented than them was able to progress that quick in the industry fair enough comment to make nothing really that big deep but again when it comes to Chrissy Teigen you know every little um every single indiscretion is treated as if like the biggest insult in the world so you know it made sense and it continues she added but like who's laughing now because she's making a ton of fucking money at the time tegan 35 said that she was disappointed that roman called her a sellout this is a huge bummer and it hit me hard i've made her recipes for over the years bought the cookbooks supported her social media and praised her in interviews she tweeted i even signed on to exclusive produce the very show she talks about doing in this article oh that was a big one anyway but the funny thing is is that um she didn't call her a sellout that's a bad term to use here she basically questioned her legitimacy of her career because she feels like, you know, it's unearned success. She didn't call it a sellout. That's not what a sellout means. It continues. Um, she added, I generally loved everything about Alison. Was jealous she got to have the book with the food and the cover instead of a face. I've made countless NOS and New York Times recipes and she's created some posts all along. Again, she always try Chris Egan has an excellent way of making herself out to be a victim in every way shape of purpose you know what i mean she she kind of leans into it right this is kind of one of those things where you could have easily just replied with hey i saw what chris Ellison Roman wrote although i'm disappointed because i'm a big fan of hers 
I totally get it. You know what? It, I don't know. You could just say something like that and move on. But she just lent into it. I was like, woe is me. And she got out an even bigger violin. Like, come on, man. Give it a break. Um, Alison Roman did apologize to Tegan saying, hi, at Alex, Chrissy Tegan. I had on Twitter. I'm generally sorry. I caused you so much pain. Um, she said, <laughs> being a woman who takes, again, being a woman who takes down other women is absolutely not my thing. And don't think it's yours either. I obviously failed to effectively communicate that. I hope we can meet one day. I think we'd probably get along roman who has also criticized marie kondo in the same interview did acknowledge her white privilege and blamed her on securities <laughs> i love the double back apology i love the honest point of view right in interviews or podcasts where a celebrity will go up and say something honestly about you know a certain thing that they've been asked about right to expound on and then also like that the next day or two when the public are you know or some section of the you know twitter blue check mark journalists out there are, are, are kind of you know put out of place like, oh, i can't believe she said that then they have to double back and apologize it's always funny <clears throat> she said i need to i need to formally apologize to chris tegan and mary kondo i use their names disparagingly to try and distinguish myself which i absolutely do not have an excuse for it was stupid careless and insensitive i need to learn respect the difference between being unfiltered and honest at being uneducated and flippant days later tegan and roman finally squashed their beef with the cravings of her tweeting that she accepted the apology thank you for this Alice roman to be clear it never once crossed my mind for you to apologize what you generally thought the comments stung but they more so stung because they came from you it wasn't my oh she's such a hater so much um it wasn't my usual news break um for some random person hating everything about me um because you make it very easy to be to have people hate you and chris is taking god almighty shut the fuck up um i still think you are incredibly talented and in, in an industry that doesn't really lend itself to supporting more than a handful of people at a time i feel like all we have is each other despite their reconciliation new york times <laughs> column was still put on hold <laughs> see all that dancing all that apologies all that crying it didn't do anything so you're better off just like saying hey i said what i said set up your sub stack and keep it moving look what she done she did like that for nothing Despite her reconciliation, Roman's New York Times cooking column was put on hold, with a spokesperson of the Times telling us she was on temporary leave. <laughs> the model uh, publicly called on the Times to reinstate Roman, but to no avail. In May, Roman shared <laughs> that she was working on the exciting projects and made a break from the Times. Yeah, I bet you were. Um, this was a huge shakeup for me, both personally and professionally. I'm still processing so much, but now, but know what I'm working on and thinking about 24 7 show on Instagram. The issue is brought to like by this whole thing will be fixed of it like and the healing process for me is gonna be long but i'm committed to doing the work and get better look at this young lady man chrissy tegan destroyed her life because she dared to say that chrissy tegan's success isn't earned and it's somehow manufactured that she has people working in a content farm churning out material for her, which she probably does have if you're chrissy tegan you probably should have a content farm full of um you know community managers putting stuff out for you why wouldn't you you're married to john legend you're a former model you're you know got millions of followers that makes all the sense in the world but she's also allowed to say as a roman as like a single white female grafting her way through the you know the gutters of you know new york times uh cooking uh columns and shit i'm not sure how many page views or stuff that stuff gets right but you know like she's more than within a right to say hey how the hell did she get that that's not fair i'm better than this girl and then you know your whole career comes clum tr comes tr crumbling down because of it absolute shocking state of affairs but yeah i wonder is chrissy teigen the most powerful woman in hollywood let me know in the comments down below next on the list what else do we have here ooh, 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 ooh. yeah we have a i guess distressing just you know it's not called distressing yeah we don't want to talk about distressing stuff on here do we not really so we have a little bit of a psa here from my guy dave portnoy from uh, barstool sports essentially ragging on the politicians to allow um you know citizens of the usa to go about living their normal lives in order to learn earn a living now of course there are people out there that are like oh you should have you know listen to the science all that stuff blah 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 i think we've kind of passed that point i think we all know the risk involved with covid we all kind of know how to mitigate the risk of some extent we've obviously got a vaccine that's on the way and we're caught in a weird position where 
if we continue just living under lock and key and not allowing some segments of the economy of the population to go back to work and to do exactly what they did prior to covid then we're going to have nothing to come back to so there is a balancing act that needs to be reached but it seems like in the us more so less so in europe and in london or in the uk i'm so happy that that in these individual states these um governors and stuff have got a little bit of a lease of new lease of life with covid they've obviously had the entire world's media pointing towards them they've garnered a bit of a reputation you look at the como brothers you know how they've kind of exploited the situation you look at the governor of michigan and how she's gone through a bit of a rough time you know with uh, plus to uh, kidnap and all that malarkey but it has turned into a weird opportunity for a lot of these political uh, figures to um use this power in order to kind of assert their authority and whatever it may be and it can be intoxicating and it can be a thing where they sort of lose um themselves and lose exactly why they're there and they're there to obviously serve the populace so it's great to see Dave Pointer kind of sticking up for the average local person trying to you know make a living and put food on their table because i guess for the most people especially in the u.s less so in, the, in europe you know they have a real aversion to like you know um uh, receiving benefits from the government they don't want handouts they want to go out and kind of you know hunt and kill something and you know feed their own family um however little that may be they'd much rather do it on their own so that's what they're asking they're saying hey we're willing to take the risk we're willing to do whatever it may be needs done to keep us safe but let us earn a living let us give us opportunity to do that so that we can kind of get back to some level of normality but so you know let's let's listen to what they point us to say regarding it Okay, I gotta do this rant. I've done it a bunch. I can't believe it. I have to do it again. But New York City just closed indoor dining. My hair is fucking big. New York City just closed indoor dining. What do they think is gonna happen? What What do they think is gonna happen to the thousands of restaurants? The bar they're done. The bar and restaurant industry and small business have been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And they've tried everything. They've been as creative as possible. You get the outdoor dining, these structures, they've had to build on their own dining. You have the glass in between the masks. You've had the six feet of separation, fewer tables. They've been as creative as you can be to save their livelihoods, to save what they've spent decades of blood, swear, sweat, and tears building. They've done whatever. They've scratched and clawed. And now a few politicians in New York City is like, eh, you're done. We're shutting it down. No indoor dining. How do you expect these people to survive? What are people going to go out to dinner now in ice cold temperatures? It's insanity. And this isn't about Corona or how dangerous and the hospitals and rising. It's not. Listen, the vaccine is right around the corner. If you're health impaired, you're afraid of it. You're old. Don't go out. Stay inside for three months. The vaccine is coming. But let people decide. I can't believe. In this country, what I consider the most basic right of them all, the right to earn a living, the right to earn a livelihood, is now being stolen. It is being stolen by a few politicians who believe they are smarter than me and you. They believe they have the right to tell me and you how to live our lives. Something you could never imagine. Basic freedoms they are stealing. And I'm not over saying it. They are stealing it. And he's right, you know, to be honest, he's right. Again, what is a right approach? Do you allow everyone to just go back to normal and, you know, hope the virus goes away in light of the vaccine? Of course not. You have to take some levels of safeguards, some levels of precautions. But just the overall kind of banning of certain segments of the economy, saying this thing can open, that thing can't open, um, then opening them again, then closing them again. It's just, it's going to lead to so much despair on the other side. And that's the problem at, at stake here. It's not, it's not, oh, what do you do now with these businesses? It's what will we be, what will we have to come back to? Or what will we have to go to once COVID is over? What will the world look like? What will your local community look like, right? Who will still be in business? Who will be your neighbor? These are all the things that the government can't and won't probably help to solve. So if that's the case, put the autonomy and the decision making process back into the hands of the citizens who voted you in that should be the way to go about doing things but you know these people man once they get a bit of power they get a bit dizzy cool so next 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 moving on in um what's we want to talk about here that i thought was interesting oh this is really good so um 
obviously you guys are aware that um um Brendan Schaub seems to have a little bit of a interesting fan base out there, right? Um, who seem to um, go out of their way to make sure that they document and highlight and clip up and record every instance where he seems to make more of a fool of himself than they kind of think of him, right? And um, it doesn't seem to end with Brendan. There's always a there's always a new clip. There's always a new controversy that he's also involved in. Week on, you know, week in, week out. Obviously, it's not it's not his fault. I think you know, if you're recording as many podcast shows as he's doing per week, you're evidently going to say something stupid along the way. But I have noticed a theme over my time of kind of observing him from afar because you know I was a big Defying the Kid fan in the beginning, and then you know over time as they sort of got more successful it kind of followed the same trajectory as a youtube channel you know as like a h3 h3 right um people loved them in the beginning and then once they started to get more successful it started to feel themselves a little bit heads started to get a bit bigger you start to see more of their personality in the videos they started to talk to you more um you then it, it easily will turn you off or on them right and for some fans it's just like you know what i've committed to you know watching your content for five years i'm just gonna stick around it is what it is but there are a lot of fans like myself who will be like you know what i don't like who you've turned into i'm not gonna hate i'm just gonna back away and it's the same happened with the fire and the kid i was a big fan of it in the beginning um big fan of it in the middle and then towards the time when they sort of got their own studio and started pulling away from fox and brendan schaub's career started to pick up steam and he started to turn into a bit of a um talking head public figure dude and you know, Brian was obviously doing his thing at the time with um, uh, the TV shows. He was on all that good stuff prior to all the allegations of rape and stuff. That was obviously a time when I thought that the show was definitely um, at a bit of a lull and it suffered greatly, which makes sense in it because they, they both had stuff outside the podcast that was really popping and giving them the opportunity to do loads of big things. Now, you know, in Brendan's defense, he was always a bit more smart in that regard where he knew where his bread was buttered. He knew the kind of, you know, the the main thing that he had to keep um going and ticking over was the podcast and tfac and the fire and the kid and he's sort of done it by hook or crook he's always made sure he puts out a show always you know whether it's with shit guest by himself or whatever it may be and it's kind of served his purpose over time but the more interesting show that i think has been the one that's really kind of shown him up mostly has been below the belt that he does on showtime at the time when he did it prior he was trying to make it into some I don't know, the first shows were a bit odd, though he saw like weird sketch comedy things, he had like a blazer on, he was doing this really weird exaggerated presenting style, and I tuned out. Then in general, I tuned out completely when I started watching Blow the Bell, and he sort of changed it into this sort of like podcast talk show sort of thing, because it generally felt like he doesn't necessarily care, not care, but he doesn't really like the UFC that much, which makes sense considering his, you know, experience and background and the time that he spent there wasn't the best right he also had a bit of a tumultuous and a relationship with dana white um he's asking my brother and just in general his career didn't necessarily go the way he wanted it to go in the ufc he went to be world champion and never quite worked out he obviously got that dressing down from joe rogan that made him essentially pivot into uh stand-up comedy so there's definitely some um I wouldn't say bitterness, but it's definitely something that he has, um, and it's a genuine, genuine, you know, feeling that he's allowed to have about you know his time at the UFC, which makes it difficult to cover it in an objective manner. But that aside, he also doesn't take time to watch or research any of the fighters prior to talking on camera. He just kind of frowns to see if his pants, based off the news he might have scanned on social media that day or that week. Or most likely what he does is parrots the information from people like, you know, Luke Thomas and all these other people, right, out there that exists that he kind of watches and takes their sound bites on. And um, it's frustrating, right? Because again, I'm a, I'm a casual fan and even I know this guy's bullshit and he doesn't know what he's talking about, which is upsetting too because I think, I'm not upsetting, which is disappointing because I think he has potential to be a pretty good anal analyst for MMA because of course he's a former you know UFC fighter. And the times that he has been a bit more, you know, committed to doing a bit of research you definitely see the difference because he obviously got you know he's got experience of being a fighter he's obviously got experience of you know fighting against a lot of people in different gyms he's got contacts with people telling him stuff so there's a lot of insight that he could bring to the space that would be very valuable you wouldn't get anywhere else just based on his experience of course athletically too he's played football that stuff there's a lot of stuff that you could basically add to his commentary but he doesn't he just you know 
just blabbers on um, as I'm doing here now and hopes to get things right. And this is a really good example of it. He, um, that for, pick up the homeless cats who kind of clipped this up. <laughs> Basically, on his recent show, he decided to sing the praise of Greg Hardy, who is a heavyweight now at the UFC, uh, a former American football player who was unceremoniously kicked out of the NFL due to some, um, due to being basic, just allegations. I'm not sure, did he ever get convicted? Actually convicted. I'm not sure if he ever was convicted but he was basically accused of domestic violence uh, by a couple of women in his life and the case for the most part looked you know bang on to rights he probably did it the NFL investigated themselves on their side and probably found probable cause he did do it he was suspended then ultimately let go and then you know, as part of course of the UFC and Dana White, they saw an opportunity to kind of cash in and get a former athlete to fight in the UFC at that level. So they decided to sign him on. And at the time when they signed him, there was a lot of uproar, right? Everyone was upset about it. Like, how are you signing on this domestic abuser? He's not probably going to represent the UFC, blah, blah, blah. And the UFC just didn't care. Dana White didn't care. He wanted more, you know, he just wanted to sign him. It is what it is. And, you know, whatever Dana White wants, he kind of gets in the UFC. He kind of runs it the way he wants to run it. So I after a while, people kind of got bored about complaining about Greg Hardy, right? Because the UFC are kind of riding by him. He's obviously trying to paint himself as, as a reformed figure. He's got this whole kind of like quasi John Jones prior to getting, you know, caught drink driving thing going on where he's kind of, you know, a bit, aloof, not aloof, but he's a little bit spiritual and woo-woo in the air. I'm not sure how long that's going to last, whether that's a, it's a, it's a new thing, whether or not it's a, it's a thing for now, temporary, or whether or not it's actual you know him and next evolution but regardless you know he's not anyone that someone's it's not he's not someone that people are super rushing to root for you just you know he's a he exists he's in the he's in the space we watch his fights it is what it is we keep it moving um but for some reason Brennan Shaw found um he thought it was his place to come out and defend him and say that he's always been a fan of Greg Hardy when in fact he was one of the strongest um people out there that was all sort of going at Greg Hardy and saying that he should never be signed for the UFC because he's domestic abuse like everybody else but now because he wants to you know appear edgy that he, he does it sometimes when he wants to like appear edgy and have like a controversial opinion he'll just say the most you know dumb thing like the opposite of whatever everyone else is saying just so he can seem different when it doesn't make any sense right a, a contrarian for the sake of it not because he actually believes what he's saying, but anyway, let's let's hear what Brendan Shaw has to say about Greg Hardy and the fact that he's always been a fan. Big up the homeless cats for the clip. Oops. I don't know why. I think it's football it's background. Yeah, yeah. For whatever reason, I root for Greg Hardy. I don't know why. I think it's football background. <laughs> His extracurricular activities outside the octagon uh, that got him banned from the... Extracurricular activities include supposedly strangling a woman and pinning her up against a wall, leaving, you know, hand marks all over her. Um and other, you know, small indiscretions like that, right? Again, the domestic violence hitting a woman, I never understood ever. It's nothing that you can never ever rationalize to me in any way, shape or form. And you know, no amount of checks or no amount of wanting to get clicks and retweets ever gonna make me think, yeah, uh hitting a woman's extra curricular activities. But again, you know, what can you do? The NFL or kicked out of the NFL it makes zero sense. It's not like... And by the way, sorry for pausing a lot here, but God damn it, Brendan looks like shit now, right? And it's again, it's such an odd thing to see as a fan. He, prior to this, right? Again, it's funny, we're in a dent t-shirt from Crystalia. But prior to this time, he was, you know, bragging and he was very confident about telling everybody that he never drinks. Um, he works out five days or seven days a week, twice a day sometimes, right? He'd always post pictures and videos of himself working out in his garage next to his Porsche, right? Just an absolute pinnacle of representation of what an alpha male is doing the thing, you know, doing stand up, rushing around, podcasting, right? Then suddenly, I don't know what happened. Maybe he was upset about the poor reaction to his special. Well, I don't know what happened. He suddenly started drinking at the age of like, what is he, 37, 35? He suddenly started drinking alcohol and becoming a whiskey efficient other. So much so that supposedly I read between on the grapevine, or, grape or actually he might have mentioned actually, I didn't read anyway. I think he might have mentioned it in passing that he's going to launch his own whiskey brand, which is, you know, typical of Brendan and wherever he gets into he tries to sell to his to his uh fans so you know great businessman in that regard but look at how much different or how much better he looks then back you know whenever this was maybe beginning of this this year maybe end of last year and compared to what it looks like in now nowadays like it looks horrible and most of it's alcohol so he, he he's on that Burt Kreischer diet like he's a huge name 
It's not like people are like, I can't wait to see this guy fight. No one is rooting for that man. <laughs> he might have a few friends in his camp or whatever, but in general, no one's rooting for him. What is he doing? What are you doing? I don't know what deal he made with Dana. Why Dana writes his nuts so bad? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he hit Dana. I don't know. Maybe he's scared. I don't know. Maybe I'm sure he's an intimidating guy. Fantastic. <laughs> This is great. When I saw this, I went, no, they're not that stupid. Hey, what are your thoughts on Greg Hardy? Do you think he has a, a legit shot at contending in the UFC? Uh, there's other guys I would market over Greg Hardy. Really? For a number of reasons, yeah. Like who? For a number of reasons, young. of course. So yeah, he's, he's still, he's he's still there. there. I don't understand one. why he's in the, that bullshit contender series. They're just doing it for reviews. <laughs> they're riding and dying on Greg Hardy, which is hilarious. But yeah, it just shows hard. you... It just shows you the nature of the business and what you're dealing with with Dana White and being a promoter. So um, I would bet my life on it. Nick Newell sells more tickets than Greg Hardy, especially as an established fighter who's a who's an amputee, congenital amputee, um, and his story is so much better. Not to mention, you're worried about Nick Newell. Uh, Nick Newell has, oh, I don't know, 20 times the amount of experience than the rest of these guys in the contender series. He fought at a high level, the World Series of Fighting. Now but again, let's go back and just compare what he said in the beginning. Whatever reason, I root for Greg Hardy. I don't know why. I think it's football background. <laughs> is that? I don't know, man. I don't know. This is the, this is this is the Brendan you're going to get now. This is if you're a fan in it. I don't... Who knows? Maybe something changed over time. He might have met the guy. Most likely, he's probably going to do a food truck dives with him. That's probably why he's saying this, just in terms of promotion. But it's such an odd thing to say. Like, does he not know people record this show? Like, or does he not know he records it himself? And you know, there's videos out there that exist that people could just go back to and refer to. It's like it's such an odd statement to make, especially for Greg Hardy. Greg Hardy isn't like some, you know, he's not some savant, right? He's not some highly talented fighter. He's bang average for the most part from the fights I've seen him in, right? He doesn't necessarily look that impressive. His athleticism his athleticism is is kind of overrated. He hasn't necessarily been able to use it to any sort of advantage. I think, you know, UFC has progressed um or has evolved since the era of Brendan Shaw where he could, you know, he I think he admitted himself he kind of got by a lot. He kind of got by or got further in his career due to his athleticism. But now you can't necessarily have that. You can't just have athleticism. Yeah, is this why I said it properly? You need to have some skill about you. And, you know, just starting, you know, fighting. Well, at the age of how old was Greg Hardy? He might have been 25, 27 or something whenever he got cut from NFL. And then, you know, trying to become world champion off the back of that with no martial arts experience prior is just not going to happen. So he's not even that impressive. He's not somebody you want to kind of, you know, want to band around to kind of boost his career. He's just like an average, an average heavyweight, you know, uh, filling in the numbers basically. And now he's one of Brendan Shaw's greatest fighters and he's his biggest fan. Hilarious. Hilarious. Anyways, that is the Axel Zinger Show episode number 411, I think, right? Is that 411? No, 412, sorry. Um, as you can see, I'm wearing my Mauer Lola hat. I think it's my, I've made my face a bit dark, so you can't actually see me here behind there. But what can you do? We are where we are. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. It'd be nice for you to do. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast, app, please leave me a five star review and share the show to your friends. Support via patrons, always more than welcome. Patreon.com for Shazakostino. Please sign up on there. You get one free bonus episode for my Patreon supporters only. For that, it's one pound equivalent as one dollar. Sign up on Patreon.com for Shazakostino. Link will be in the show notes. Do that. Support the show. Get involved. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Peace.